by guy wearing a necktie in this pin, and the first few words I will say in this talk, may give you the misconception that this is a speech. This is not a speech. This is a conversation. No, not even a conversation. This is a Socratic discussion. The only difference between this and an actual Socratic discussion is that our responses are sort of delayed. I give out the beginning of the discussion, and then I have to wait for that beginning of the discussion to upload so that all of you can see it, and then you have to respond, and then we have to respond. So it's sort of a delayed, slow-paced Socratic discussion. But it's still a Socratic discussion. So, today, I'm going to talk about part of the history of science, from Newton to Einstein. Now, we will in the future do uh, overviews on physical history that extend further back than Newton and f further more than Einstein because quantum mechanics and computing is a really important thing. And we will also... We will also be splitting this series up into three parts. So, for the first part, we'll be talking about Newton and uh, Faraday. So, don't often see prodigies that much in our world today. They may come every century, they may come every two centuries, they may come every four centuries, who knows? But still, we see prodigies in every era of human thought. And science, or humans have thought as long as humans have existed. In fact, there is even an entire subject based on the thoughts of humans on themselves and the thoughts of humans on how to do good in the world around them. Now, when we were, uh, we went from like curious animals who used basic tools and used our tails to sw uh, swing around on branches and trees, we went from all that to dominating other animals. Now, uh, don't ask me about evolution, because uh, religion and science kind of disagree on that one, if you know what I mean. But, but um, what I uh, mean is that, uh, well, I'm not too much of an expert on evolution, but what I am an expert on is history. So, we started out with the Stone Age. We used stone tools, we used things like that. And when we were, uh, the ancients really you, uh, discovered fire. Fire was such a useful tool that uh, ancients actually made poems about gods stealing fire from Zeus or whatever su other supreme god there was and giving it to humans and things like that. So like, for example, the myth that a beaver chased down a, a cedar tree in order to get fire, or that Prometheus stole the virtue of fire from Zeus and gave it to humans because he really liked humans. And so it was seen as heavenly by humans because it was uh, absolutely wonderful. It gave them heating. It gave them a way to cook their food and make it tastier. And it gave them a way to uh, burn up their belongings that they didn't need. So, as you can see, well, as you can see, fire was like revolutionary. And it also allowed us to make our stone tools sharper. So, like, for example, now, sharp rock. We can stab other, uh, I mean, we can stab prey with it. Then we discovered iron. And that immediately led us to better tools, better materials. And then the, uh, it all skyrocketed from there. We made our own civilization. We made what we now call countries. We uh, explored around the world, something that other animals typically don't do. And we uh, rapidly outpaced other animals in technology. To this day, there are only a few animals that use rocks and sticks and stones and tools like we did before we evolved into what we are now. Or we developed our tools and technology into what they are now. So, it had been a very impressive cycle from them. Now, what caused us to discover Iron. What caused us to progress our technology over and over and over and more and more and more again and again and again? What caused us to do that? Well, 
what caused us to do that was science. Specifically, the empirical branch of science helped us to experiment, to gain more results, and to try again. And the other sector of science, which was a theoretical, was uh, mostly based on God and heaven at that time. But in the 1800s and beyond, it started becoming more scientific. So, uh, empirical science was the main thing of the, uh, was the main thing of the day, while science wasn't really the thing of the day because nobody thought experimenting was cool. Everybody thought that everything could be explained by God. But still, some of certain few wanted to get deeper into the truth, and now it's really. It's really given me an existential crisis. Anyway, let me tell you why I am doing this. Normally, ten-year-olds are not giving a giant speech. I mean, uh, giving Socratic discussions or participating in Socratic discussions where they talk about the history of science. Typically, ten-year-olds are not doing that. Ten-year-olds are usually playing games on their controller, or finishing their homework, or eating chips or junk, something like that. They are not doing what I am doing right now. But why? Well, I was extremely curious in science when I was two. In fact, I fell in love with science when I was two. And most youngsters, and especially very young people like toddlers, are very curious about how our world works. So why don't we see the same enthusiasm about that in adults? Uh, you can probably guess it. It's a very easy question. I'll give you the, uh, a hint. It starts with an E and ends with an M. What is the answer? Five, four, three, two, one. Education system. Exactly. The education system is horrible. No, at least in the United States. The education system stigmatizes certain subjects like mathematics and science and shows them as subjects only for geniuses. As a result, many more get math anxiety and lose hope in being able to find the truth behind it all. They lose hope in trying to at least do basic mathematics. And in fact, so many see uh, this is difficult, and that is difficult, and they see breakthroughs is, uh, and trying to work through math problems not fun, but tedious and boring. They see mathematics is just equations over equations over equations over graphs, this and that, and weird techniques. They don't see math for what it really is, complete fun. And, I mean... That math is fun for a lot of it. And in fact, math, some people have even resorted to doing mathematics for the fun of it. Have you heard of pure math? Yeah, it's math that has absolutely no use whatsoever. People just do it for fun. So, exactly, why doesn't everybody do this for fun? Because the education system says it's hard. And they ma do make it hard. They make it hard for students to actually understand what they mean. And they make it hard for students to actually believe that mathematics is an easy subject or that you can get through mathematics. They don't provide hands-on experiments, so students are left ununderstanding of what's in front of them. So that's why most adults don't have the same interest in science as children do. And I honestly find I am happy when uh, I don't or other people so awe in what I do. But it also kind of saddens me because a lot of people, first of all, a lot of people don't expect children to be doing this stuff. And second of all, a lot of people think that mathematics is really hard. So when they see a child doing it, they're like, oh my god, wow, oh, 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 whoa, whoa. But that's really sad because I should be doing the same uh, kind of math too. If I'm doing literally high school math on the street and people are freaking out in front of me, that's concerning. 
well, it is the Bronx, so well, what do I expect? But still, it's really concerning. So, that is why I think we need to fix the education system.